Good evening, West Meadows. Good to see you. I trust that you're having a uh, good week. I uh, just want to make a few announcements before we get going in our study tonight, Revelation 14. Uh, don't forget, this coming Sunday, we're going to have services uh, at 1030, and uh, we'll be recognizing all the mothers uh, this Sunday as well. But if you do not feel comfortable coming and so forth, uh, if you're older especially, uh, and you want to be more cautious, we will be live streaming uh, the services at 1030. Um, but uh, no Sunday school or anything like that, but just services at 1030. And then preaching uh, will be after our music and so forth. So that's going on this coming Sunday. It's Mother's Day. And we are practicing the social distancing in the event that we do go over 50 uh, what we may do is we'll have those go over to the fellowship hall um, and that way we can live stream over there. So just want to let you be aware of that. Also, uh, just want to mention a prayer request. Uh, this afternoon we uh, had to get uh, Brother Bernie transported to Mayo and we believe he has a, a UTI and he's really having some difficulty and coherency and so forth. And so they are admitting him. I just got word from my sister. So they are admitting him tonight, but we don't know how long he's going to stay. Uh, but we do appreciate your prayers, and we'll, we'll mention them more about that prayer request time. Uh, we're in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14. Uh, we are looking, just kind of a quick review, chapters 12 and 13. We kind of see the tribulation from Satan's perspective. In chapter 12, we saw Satan's attempt to destroy Israel. And then in chapter 13... You remember we had the two beasts. We had the Antichrist in verses 1 through 10, and then verses 11 through 18, the false prophet, uh, who was kind of like the high priest for Satan. They're both uh, working with Satan, kind of the unholy trinity. That's not a, a title in the Bible, but that's kind of what they operate as. Now we come to chapter 14 tonight, and uh, I kind of summarized it this way. It's the 2-3-2. Two, and what I mean by that is in verses 1 through 5, we'll see uh, two Ps, praise and purity. And uh, then we'll see three angels in verses 6 and 7, verse 8, and then verses 9 through 12. And then the other two is two harvests. We see the grain harvest in verses 14 through 16, and then the grape harvest in verses 17 through 20. So Revelation chapter 14 uh, we'll pick up reading verse 1. We'll read the entire chapter. It's only 20 verses long. Verse 1 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as a voice of many waters, and as a voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders... And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give him glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or, nor night, which worship the beast and his image, whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, 
and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on, sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrusted his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had the power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. All right, so a lot in this chapter. Let's go back and uh, go with the 232 like we talked about. The first thing we see is, uh, we might call it redemption song in verses 1 through 5. Two P's involved with this, uh, praise and purity. Notice uh, the praise in verse 1. John says, and, look, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, this is the same group that was mentioned in chapter 7 of Revelation, the 144,000. They are Jewish evangelists, 12,000 from every tribe. John sees two things here. He sees the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and the 144,000 standing with him. He also hears two things. Uh, what he hears, heavenly harps and then also heavenly hosanna. You'll notice uh, one of the things in the New Old Testament Harps were frequently associated with joyous praise, not judgment. Um, some examples of that, 2 Samuel 6 and verse 5, 1 Chronicles 13, 8, also 1 Chronicles 15, verse 16, and also verse 28. There are several other ones in Nehemiah and Psalms 33, 2, Psalm 71, 22, Psalm 144, 9. Uh, this song is one of redemption. Some have speculated that it very well may be the... Uh, verses 3 and 4 of Revelation 15, which Lord willing we'll get into next week. While the angels do not experience what we call redemption, they do rejoice because of it. We see that in Luke chapter 15 and verse 10, over the angels rejoicing over one that comes to repentance. Uh, all of heaven will give praise to God for the redemption completed in Christ Jesus through his resurrection and return. Now, one of the marks of a triumphant Christian. If I were to ask you, you say, how would you know that this person is a Christian? Well, I think there's several things that we would see. One is their love. Jesus said, by this, will all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. Uh, I think it's John 13, 35, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but also praise. And you think about praise um, is giving praise to God, even in difficulties. Um, Joy is a natural outflow of a praising heart that trusts God's sovereign power. You see this in places, and Paul mentions this in Philippians 3, verse 1, Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice, I say, evermore, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, and everything give thanks, uh, James 1, 2, 1 Peter 4, 13. So we see these 144,000 giving praise. Um, Notice these harpers in verse 2 says harping with their harps. We mentioned that. They sung this new song before the throne. It's interesting, this uh, phraseology, you see it mentioned a lot in the Psalms. David even said uh, that he has, uh, he's singing a new song before the Lord. You'll see some of the Old Testament prophets talking about he raised me up out of a miry pit, out of, you know, and set my foot on a rock. And the idea there is they're singing a new song. Um, and notice they do this before the four beasts and the elders. No man could learn the song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Now, this is going on during the tribulation. So you find that there are people, uh, they're called the first fruits unto God, to the Lamb. And you'll notice there was in their mouth there was found no God. Okay? 
So this is the 144,000. Uh, we would say that they were, you know, Jewish evangelists. And so that's what's going on. Notice also their purity. Uh, no doubt during the tribulation, the worship of the Antichrist during tribulation will be very perverse and very vile. Sin will run rampant. I mean, we see a lot of that even today. Uh, in the midst of this immorality, these 144,000 stand out in quite a contrast. It's almost like they shine as beacons of purity. Uh, and moral purity is essential to triumphant Christian living. Uh, you see that in 1 Thessalonians 4.3, uh, that it's God's will that we abstain from fornication. 2 Timothy 2.22, 1 Corinthians 6.13 and verse 18. So we see praise in verses 1 through 3, and then purity also verses 4 and 5. But now let's go on to what we call the, the three angels. And you see this is in verses 6 through 12. The first two, or the first one is in verses 6 and 7. He says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. That's the same phraseology that's in chapter 7. All right, so these are people, they will be saved during the tribulation, but most likely it will cost them their lives. They will not take the mark of the beast, so they very well may die. Uh, this angel proclaims the everlasting gospel. Um, some of you may have heard of something called the Hope Diamond. Uh, it's the largest blue diamond. It's a 45.55 carat blue diamond. It's at the Museum of Natural History in Smithsonian up in Washington, D.C. And they have a guard there, an armed guard, but every so many seconds, what happens is it's, it's in its display case, and every few seconds it turns, and it has a spotlight. And you see the very various facets of this diamond. It's a beautiful diamond. Uh, we've seen it several times on the junior-senior trip. And uh, a lot of people want to come and just see that diamond. Well, the everlasting gospel is kind of like that. It's multifaceted. And when you look at the gospel... Not only, I mean, there's so many aspects of it, uh, or facets, we might say. It's everlasting. God does not change the gospel. It's the same gospel. Uh, we could say, oh, well, it reaches the uttermost and the guttermost. You know, it reaches those that are in with all kinds of resources. It reaches those with no resources. All right? It reaches across racial barriers. It reaches, the gospel has so many dimensions, so many facets Uh it reminds us of this diamond. The gospel is called the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew 4, 23. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ in Mark 1, 1. It's called the gospel of God in Mark 1, 14. It's called the gospel of the grace of God in Acts 20, 24. It's called the gospel of the glory of Christ in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. It's called the gospel of salvation in Ephesians 1, 13. It's called the gospel of feet, of peace in Ephesians 6.15. It's called the glorious gospel in 1 Timothy 1.11. And in this passage, it's referred to as the everlasting or eternal gospel because it provides the means to eternal life. So that's what we're seeing here uh, in verse 6. This angel, and he has the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, all right? Now, his message, all right, reminds us, uh, kind of like Solomon. You remember the end of Ecclesiastes when he says, let's hear the conclusion of the whole of the, the whole thing. Fear God and keep his commandments, all right? Well, this is kind of what he's saying here, uh, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, in verse 7 there, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. It's amazing we live in a world today that worships anything and everything but the truth, the true God, all right? They'll worship, I mean, you can even break it down here. They will worship the sky. They'll worship the earth, you know. Uh, it's not just tree huggers and all that kind of thing, but they, they do, you know, they love the earth. There are those that worship the sea. There's those that worship the fountains of water, all right? Uh, just when you think somebody can't come up with something new, they'll be worshiping it. Uh, it reminds you of the Romans 1 passage about they uh, love the creature more than the creator. 
Rather than worshiping God who made all these things, they will worship the things themselves. So it's very similar to what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Now, this angel will call out with a loud voice to all ungenerate people. We would say unsaved uh, everywhere. His voice ensures he will be heard and also stresses the urgency of his message. Uh, now, will people listen? Uh, most likely they will not, because look at verse 8. It says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So this second angel here is pronouncing judgment. The implication is the first angel's message was largely rejected. Now, Babylon has always symbolized evil and rebellion against God. You remember all the way back in Genesis chapter 11, it was founded by Nimrod, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 10, verse 9. It was also the site of the first organized system of false religion. That's where the Tower of Babel comes from, Babylon, uh, modern-day Iraq, believe it or not. So interesting that it ties in. False religion is basically spiritual prostitution. Um, I was reading today, uh, I'm in Ezekiel, and I was reading about these two sisters, and both of them were harlots, uh, Hola and Holabob. They were sisters. And they, God uh, said that they were practicing their whoredoms and so forth, and he calls one of them Assyria, and he calls the other one Jerusalem. And he, the point that he was making was the fact that they, just as they practiced immorality, these cities practice immorality, and it was spiritual prostitution. They, in other words, they were serving false gods. They were not serving the true God. Uh, another prophet comes to mind, Hosea. You remember God told Hosea to go out and to marry Gomer, who was a prostitute. And that would, that would be a shock today, you know, people. But God told him to do that. And what he was trying to do is help Israel see the message of how they had been unfaithful to God. And just as Gomer left Hosea and he went and wooed her back, all right, God was trying to do that with Israel. Uh, and so this is the, the implication here, the second angel. Um, notice uh, it pictures unfaithfulness to God. That's what it pictures. Now notice the third angel in verses 9 through 12. It says this, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, okay? So contrast, there are two different groups. These people, we talked about it a little bit last week, they take the mark of the beast, they worship the Antichrist, okay, uh, which is empowered by Satan, and we talked about him being killed or giving the appearance of being killed last week, and then he will miraculously uh, be raised again. Some believe that he will be empowered by Satan himself upon his resurrection, uh, we know that they are both empowered, the false prophet and the Antichrist are empowered by Satan. But what we're getting at here, this angel promises damnation, and it's against all those who worship the beast and take his mark. Uh, now, the verb translated tormented in verse 10 speaks of the ceaseless infliction and unbearable pain. Uh, fire and brimstone. Now, brimstone, you might remember, is sulfur. I don't know if you've ever smelt uh, burnt sulfur, all right? I used to do a demonstration where you put sugar in a beaker and you could pour sulfuric acid on this. It's not something you want to do with kids, but you pour, pour sulfuric acid on there and what happens, it reacts with that sugar very hot, probably three or 400 degrees in a beaker. And what takes place is it becomes carbon and it will come up even out of the beaker, all right? And it, it has a very distinct and strong odor because that sulfuric acid is reacting. Well, brimstone is sulfur. And we see God's judgment here 
Uh, you saw it with Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament, uh, Genesis 19, 24, and 25. Uh, he mentions in Psalm 11 and verse 6, also Luke 17 and verse 29. And so what's going to take place is these people who take the mark, God is going to judge them. Now, although God's judgment is sure, men still refuse to repent. And as John said in his gospel, they love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And that's a quotation from John, uh, God, John's gospel, John 3, verse 19. And that's, that's true even today. People love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. All right? Um, so that's the three. So we looked at, you remember the first two, praise and purity, and then the three angels, all right, in verses uh, 6 through 12. Well, now we come to the other two, and it's the two harvests, the grain harvest and the, the, the grape harvest. So notice, pick up, uh, well, we pick up verse 13. This is kind of a segue, if you will. And he said, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. What we'll share we you, this doesn't really pertain, but I, I, the last time I used this verse in a funeral was for one of our deacons who passed away. He's with the Lord now, Brother Willie Denmark. And uh, while we were getting, I was there by myself with the funeral people and so forth, and they were wanting to bring in his casket and so forth for the viewing. And as we were bringing it in, we came up the ramp that's beside the, what we call the front of the church. It's actually the back of the auditorium, but the front porch. And so we were coming up that ramp, and he was rolling the casket and so forth, and he was saying that this is really nice. And I, and I told the funeral director, I said, Brother Willie was instrumental in us getting that ramp. And I thought of this verse because not only do they rest from their labors, but their works do follow them. What we do today can make an eternal difference in somebody's life. Uh, not just because of this virus that's going around, but what we do, the interaction we give and so forth. And so that's not only true of these saints that died during the tribulation, that's even true for us today. Uh, so notice verse 14. Let's get into the harvest judgment here. Uh, it's called the grain harvest. Verse 14 says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. All right? So what we're seeing here, this grain harvest, you might remember in the Old Testament, uh, the reaping of grain preceded the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, that's an annual feast of jubilation and joy, uh, and that's where the Jews, they would build tents or booths, tabernacles, if you will, and they would camp out basically in a week, for a week, is how we would look at it. Uh, and notice it was a time of jubilation and joy. Uh, the same is true here. Before the long-awaited, what we call millennial reign of Christ, that thousand-year reign of Christ, there must be a harvest judgment. Now, the Son of Man, as he mentions here, um, in verse, um, verse 14, 15, all right, the Son of Man is none other than the Lord himself. And this is a reference to Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13. In the Lord's parable in Matthew 13, Christ is the sower. You remember he says, a sower went forth to sow. And he says specifically that the sower is the Son of Man. Here, he's the reaper. Uh, several passages in the Old Testament describe this judgment. Let me just give you a few references. Isaiah 13, verses 11 through 13. Uh, Isaiah 24, 21 through 23. And then also Joel 2, 18 through chapter 3 and verse 21. So this is talking about this harvest judgment or this grain harvest. Now, as the tribulation nears its climax, all right, God shows us two remaining aspects of his wrath that will be poured out on sinful world. The first aspect is the seven bold judgments, and we'll see that in Revelation 16, 1-21. And the second 
aspect is the battle of Armageddon, at which point Jesus Christ will return and judge and destroy his enemies. We'll see that in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21. Now, he, it's interesting here, when he talks about the crown, all right, uh, when he talks about this crown on his head, verse 14, he's not talking about a diadem or diadema worn by a king, but this is the Stephanus, all right? This is worn by victors in war or athletic events. It is the crown of triumph. It's the same crown that uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, talks about. Uh, and striving for a crown, yea, that those that run, you know, in 1 Corinthians and so forth, they run all, but only one receives the crown. Okay, well, this is the crown, the Stephanus that he's talking about. And then notice this sickle. You, you say, what in the world? Uh, a lot of people think Grim Reaper. Okay, that, that can be an accurate picture, but it's a long, curved, razor-sharp iron blade attached to a long, what we might say, broomstick with a wooden handle. All right, and so if you have that picture in your mind of a grim reaper, that's the picture here of here's someone doing this grain harvest because they would use that sickle to cut down the grain. It's interesting that he says here, he uses a word uh, in verse 15 that the harvest of the earth is ripe. Uh, maybe a better translation might be withered or overripe or rotten. Uh, the earth pictured here is past the point of its usefulness. And it's fit only to be gathered up and burned with fire. Uh, Matthew 13, verse 40 talks about that. So this is the grain harvest that he's talking about here. But then in verse 17 through 20, he talks about the grape harvest. Notice verse 17. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. So similar picture here. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even into the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. Okay, so the great harvest, all right? Uh, this harvest speaks of the judgment that takes place at the Battle of Armageddon. That's kind of like the final showdown. Some would say, you know, kind of showdown at OK Corral. Well, this is God's final judgment. It's a final battle. Uh, notice out of the altar, we, this was already mentioned in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. It reminds you of the Old Testament, you remember uh, the priest offered twice a day the, on the altar of incense in Exodus 40, verse 5, where they burnt incense twice a day, and it was a picture of the prayers that would go up. And we see that true in Revelation. You remember the martyrs? We talked about this a little bit last week from chapter 6, and they said, How long, O Lord? And, and the answer was, To your fellow servants, okay, also died. And we saw that last week. So, they are underneath the altar, and they're viewed praying. Uh, you saw that in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. Uh, it's mentioned or referenced in Psalm 141 and verse 2, also Luke 1 and verse 10. In Revelation 8, 3 through 5, the martyred saints are praying for God to take vengeance on their tormentors and send his wrath. So that's what's happening. Notice these clusters of grapes. They represent unrepentant sinners. Now, sometimes we see a person, and they can be so hardened. You know, they refuse to change. I mentioned that briefly Sunday. Uh, what happens every time we interact with the Word of God, if we are responsive, if we are like David, search me, O oh God, show me what's wrong, straighten me out, lead me in the way everlasting. If that's our prayer, and, I, and I'm basing that on Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, if that's how we come to the Word of God, every time we read God's Word, He has something to say to us. And so what takes place, it doesn't mean we're going to change every time we read God's Word, but it should cause us to consider. It, we, should always, we should always be growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And what takes place here, 
these unrepentant sinners refuse and they are they reject what God has to say and they're going to be cut off by the reaper's sharp sickle uh, notice he also mentions this word in verse 18 her grapes are fully ripe okay now this is a different it's not talking about overripe rotten in this passage in this verse 18 but it's a different word and it means fully ripe at its prime so uh, you'll hear people talk about uh, when a young person especially dies unexpectedly we had that with a family recently just unexpectedly and here's a person we think they got their whole life in front of them especially when it's a child you see that uh, we say man they had their whole life they, they were in their prime you know of life well that's the idea here in verse 18 these unrepentant sinners are in their prime uh, the wine press uh, just so you kind of picture how a wine press worked in the Old Testament and here too that consisted of two stone basins connected by a trough and what would happen is grapes would be trampled on they put the grapes in the upper what we would say the upper basin and literally people would get in there hopefully they have clean feet but they would trample they would press down the grapes and the juice would run down the basin or the bat if you will um, the trough and it would go into the second lower one uh, and as the grapes were stomped you would imagine you could see especially if it's dark grapes just them bursting and so forth and splattering and so forth well that's the vivid picture that he's talking about here this is going to be picturing the blood of those who are going to be destroyed and you see this mentioned in Isaiah chapter 63 verse 3 uh, Lamentations 1 15 and also Joel 3 and verse 13 and notice how significant uh, it talks about in verse 20 a thousand six hundred furlongs it's going to be up to the horse's bridle uh, originally you say what is a furlong well originally it was the length of one furrow on a one acre piece of land okay now a little bit just so you can kind of get a picture specifically what we're talking about is one eighth of a mile 660 feet 220 yards or if you like the European thing, 201 meters, okay? Uh, that's how far furlong is. So when we talk about 1,600 furlongs, what we're talking about is about 184 miles, okay? That's how long we're talking about. And we'll see more of this in Revelation 19, verse 11 through 21, when we talk about this battle of Armageddon. So the blood it's talking about here is going to be up to the horse's bridles. That's hard to fathom, right? Uh, there are certain pictures in Scripture. One comes to mind. You remember when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, and they kept begging God, we won't quail, we won't quail, we won't quail. And God gave it to them up to their knees. And after a period of 30 days of eating quail every day, it said, and while it was still in their nostrils, it stank, okay? So what took place is they got sick of it, all right? They had it. He said, okay, you want it? And it's interesting because God uses a, a passage. He says he gave them their request, but he sent leanness to their soul, all right? Well, here we find another vivid picture about the blood being up to the horse's bridle. So you think about a horse, and you think about, okay, that's probably up to the bridle. is probably four to five foot, okay? And that's how massive that this battle is going to be and the blood flow and the people that will be dead and killed. Uh, and that's in Revelation 19. So we'll look at that in a few weeks. Uh, Lord willing, we'll get to that. But uh, appreciate you tuning in tonight. Uh, I do want to mention uh, again, in case you tuned in a little late, uh, some uh, what's happening this weekend. We are planning to have service. It's a new time for us. Uh, I say new. The last few weeks, the whole month of April, we were pretty well doing the 1030. So we'll be having music at 1030, and then we'll be doing preaching around, you know, right after the music is done. Um, so that's Mother's Day. We are going to be recognizing all the mothers who are there. If you do not feel comfortable with that, uh, and you say, well, I'd rather stay home, we are going to be still live streaming. All right. I mentioned Sunday. We appreciate those who have given money towards a new camera and a, also a computer so that we can do that. 
Uh, Lord willing, it's supposed to come in tomorrow. I'm not sure that we're going to have it all operational by Sunday because Brother Nathan's going out of town and be back Saturday night late. Uh, but we will, we will be live streaming this coming Sunday. And Lord willing, we'll be able to get back into our, what we might say, regular scheduled times um, over the next few weeks. And so we'll let you know about that, but we will be live streaming uh, this coming Sunday. And we'll be practicing the social distancing. If we have over 50 that come, uh, we'll be doing the overflow in the, the lunchroom or fellowship hall over there, and we'll live stream for those people as well. So uh, if you're older and you don't feel comfortable with that, we, you, we don't have any problem with you staying home and so forth. But just want to mention that. As far as prayer requests tonight, uh, I know if we do are able to get back to our Wednesday night next week, uh, we share these things and sharing them on Facebook or even Facebook Live. Uh, we're not trying to, to embarrass anyone uh, by that, uh, but it's just the only way we have to communicate. So be praying for those who we have mentioned in the past. Uh, I did mention Sunday, uh, the Murphy son-in-law, John Harrison, that's undergoing cancer treatment and chemo again and a lot of pain. I know he'd appreciate our prayers. I uh, miss Peggy's brother. Uh, I didn't have a chance to talk with her, but we'll be praying for him. Uh, in case you tuned in a little late, uh, after I made the announcements earlier, uh, Brother Bernie had to be taken to uh, Mayo tonight, or about 5 o'clock, and we were able to get the transportation worked out. My sister is still with him there, allowing her to stay at the moment. Uh, we're not sure if she'll be able to spend the night or not, but they are admitting him. Uh, we believe UTI, but there's he's got a fever. There's several other things going on, so I know he'd appreciate your prayers. He has been very feeble the last few days. I uh, did dialysis. I took him yesterday, but I know he'd appreciate your prayers. But uh, that's those that we know of that we need to pray. Uh, Brother Billy Bray, I did get a notice from him that said he appreciated our prayers as he's been had his surgery. He's the pastor at Hope for Life Baptist. So do be praying. Continue to pray for these folks. Uh, I know they would appreciate it. Uh, but we're looking forward to Sunday, and uh, we got things ready. They have claimed the church and wiped everything down, and so everything is, uh, I think we're set. Bathrooms have all been recleaned and so forth, and uh, they even cut all the grass today. So things are looking good, and we appreciate that. And God is answering prayer. Uh, it's exciting to see God answering prayer uh, in a lot of ways. And thank you again for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, we've been able to meet our obligations, and we're thankful for that. We don't take that for granted. Uh, we know God is faithful. And we appreciate your tithes and offerings. And uh, be praying for Mother's Day as we seek to honor our mothers. And uh, we look forward to seeing you Sunday.